again, thanks everyone for, for joining us. Uh, I don't know what webinar or I don't know, if, are these even called webinars? There's sort of like something between uh, a webinar and a podcast, I guess. I guess we can call them webinars. Uh, I don't even know what number we're on right now, but it's uh, amazingly, we're in July. We're firmly in the second half of 2021. And we wanted to thank you all for sticking with us this entire time. This is a great community of food professionals that are here. And as I always say, um, it is as much about you and, and your contributions to the conversation as it is about the content itself. So with that in mind, uh, you know the drill. Uh, make sure you hit chat. Tell us what you're thinking. Nothing's off limits. Choose either all panelists and attendees, or depending on, I guess, your version of Zoom, I might just say everyone, to make sure that your chat messages are seen by everybody and not just Carly, Mike, and myself. Um, uh, Mike and Carly probably need no introduction, but I'll go ahead and do that anyways. Uh, they're, they're both experts on trends and what's happening in consumers' minds and important parts of the team here at Data Central. And today's um, webinar is gonna be a little bit more on the fun side. We're gonna talk about some very important things about the grand reopening. We're gonna see some really interesting examples of what's actually happening in the wild as well. Before we get fully started, I wanted to remind everyone, if you haven't had a chance yet, Make sure you check out Report Pro, which you get access from Data Central's Snap Tool, which many of you um, are already using or may even be using right now as we speak. And as a reminder, what Report Pro is, is it's basically unlimited access to our entire library of reports. There is over a thousand reports in there with many new reports published every single week. So if you like some of the content that you've seen with the uh, complimentary COVID reports we've been doing or just what we've been doing on this webinar series. There's a ton more of that on every topic imaginable. And what we sort of discovered at some point was previously we spent so much time trying to figure out what we should write a report on and what we should, you know, deep dive into and all the conversations with clients and back and forth that ate up so much time that we said, you know what, we sort of know what a lot of these big topics should be. So let's just focus more energy and build a dedicated team around just cranking out fantastic high quality content at a really rapid pace. And Report Pro is the end result of that. So come check it out. Um, in just the last couple of weeks, we've had, I think, over a dozen new reports published in Report Pro that are totally available to you with any of your Report Pro subscriptions. This includes a look at seasonal LTOs, the big macro factors that are influencing the world of food that we all should know about, what's happening with cashless stores and restaurants as we move to um, the next evolution of, uh, of, a, of a cash-free environment, a really big, super deep dive on the world of desserts down at the category level, what's happening with a number of different new concepts around frozen, fresh, and other foods at retail, uh, a look at brand new trends that you want to know about in Trend Watch from Karayage to a number of others. And then I only have four shown here, but there's actually, I think, like a dozen of them, different segment recovery guides for every segment of food service. What's happening with that segment? Uh, what, are the, what's the, what are the challenges? What's the outlook? And what needs to be done to, oper to capitalize on all the opportunities that that segment has ahead? And this is just in the last two weeks. Um, we also have a really awesome thing. It's our mid-year trends sneak preview. We have our mid-year trends big report coming out soon, but you can get a preview of it right now. I don't know, Mike, did you want to just say something about what that mid-year trends report is and what you can expect to find in this preview? Yeah, sure. So uh, in the preview itself, you're just going to find 10 really quick facts, figures, and trends that you need to know covering everything from the COVID recovery to how many restaurants are open um, to just some of the trends that, you know, have kind of moved in the past year. And then the big mid-year trend report that we have coming out in the next couple of weeks has everything from uh, our menu trends updates. So what are the latest things happening on the American menu uh, to just some data that surprised us in some of our recent reports. It's, it's a huge report. It's uh, probably gonna be about 150 pages and it just really focuses on everything that we think you need to know at this point in the year. Yeah, especially coming out of the pandemic when trends are taking different turns than we've ever seen before. Um, and. Uh, just to give you a preview of some of the other reports that will be debuting in Report Pro over the course of the next couple of weeks, we have a report on what the restaurant of the future looks like, that giant mid-year trends report that Mike just mentioned, uh, a look around the South and what's happening there, sort of a virtual dine around of what's happening in the South, 
um, a trend watch, fun dive on what's happening with really interesting desserts, uh, food sampling at retail, a deep dive into global beverages, um, eating on the go, which many more of us have been doing since the pandemic, how we can make a return to upscale dining, and then also look at individual communities across the country and what's happening there, whether it's Boise, Fargo, Knoxville, Montana, and the list goes on and on. So you expect to see these in just the next couple of weeks. Uh, again, I think we're over a thousand different reports with more every week. Uh, and you know, basically, if you're not using Report Pro, you're sort of doing it wrong. So we invite you to give that <laughs> a look. And with that, I wanted to get started today before we get into the really fun stuff with maybe some of the stuff that's not quite as fun, but actually pretty interesting and still worth knowing about, which is you've probably noticed a lot more headlines over the past uh, couple of weeks, maybe a month or so, around additional uh, new variants of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2, right? It's not just the Delta variant. There is a Delta Plus variant now. There's an Epsilon variant. There's a Lambda variant. There is a Gamma variant. And the thing that we should sort of remember is that uh, variants are not rare. There is a boatload of them. Uh, viruses continue to mutate, and they mutate quite frequently. And to give you an example, um, uh, I would actually recommend if anyone's interested in this, go to um, uh, Gizade. It's a, I think it's a German initiative. It's a public-private partnership. And what they do is they track the uh, um, uh, phylogenetic tree uh, of different viruses. Uh, and you know, SARS-CoV-2 certainly being one of them. This piece over here, I don't know if you can see my mouse wiggling around. This is sort of the... Um, uh, variant, you know, the phylogenetic variant tree for SARS-CoV-2. And you can see just how many different variants there, there are. And the, the colors represent what, uh, what are called clades, which are basically groupings of similar viruses. So you could say, you know, roughly these are all sort of in that, you know, delta bracket, and these are all sort of in that gamma bracket. There's a ton of them. And, you know, the one mutations happen, the vast majority of mutations are totally benign. Uh, most of them probably actually weaken the virus, you know, you know, but you have occasionally that random mutation that actually strengthens the virus or makes it more capable of something like immune escape, uh, where perhaps it can dodge a vaccine in the future. It seems like we're getting uh, a lot more of these, or certainly they're, they're being talked about quite a bit more. So don't be surprised if you keep seeing um, additional letters of the Greek alphabet uh, make it into headlines, because these are here. And I wanted to, and again, you can go to, I, I forget what the URL is, but if you just Google um, GIS AID, you can get to the website. There's a ton of data there. It is super, super interesting. So I actually thought what would be an interesting question to ask everyone is, is this, if, if there were a, a variant that emerged that achieved immune escape, meaning that it essentially dodges the vaccine in the majority of cases, what do you think we should do. Um, would you support bringing back mask mandates and stricter social distancing rules? Or do you think that this just sort of goes in one direction and we just sort of keep on doing what we've been doing? So if a new variant emerges that can escape current vaccines, should we go back to stricter distancing, mask mandates, maybe even a little bit of a lockdown? Who knows, but directionally. Um, Mike, Carly, uh, without giving up your personal opinion, because I get this is a very personal type of a thing, what do you think the, um, uh, the food industry that's voting right now, <laughs> which way do you think they're going? Um, I'm going to say 65% say that they would support um, additional stricter measures again. Carly? Mm, I'm going to say... 60 say they would not. Okay, so Mike, you think the uh, predominance say uh, they would support measures and probably say most people think that we should just keep on, it's a one-way street, Let, let's not go backwards. Uh, so I'm actually uh, a little bit oh, surprised. Even more. Yeah, three out of four say they would support going back to something, um, which is a bit surprising because we are quite little of the food industry and perhaps one of the industries most impacted uh, mm -hmm. by this, but let's see, let's see where this goes. So hopefully that doesn't become a thing, but, uh, frankly, 
it seems like it's quite likely that it's going to happen at some point. So let's see where it goes. Okay. So with that, and that's a perfect segue to a lot of things <laughs> really, really close together. They are outdoors, though, which makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Uh, or so it would seem. Uh, Mike, Carly, what do we have to say about this? Yeah, so this first section, we are going to look at, you know, some of the reopening that's happening across the country. And this is the picture that we were talking about before we got started, which this is out of Nashville from Independence Day weekend. And they actually had more people come to the city. I think it was 350,000 people coming to their annual Let Freedom Sing fireworks show and concert, which is more than they've ever had in all the time that they've been doing this. So on the one hand, you can see, you know, there is this population that feels, you know, pretty comfortable getting back together. And you definitely see there's pent up demand for events like this. On the other hand, we did see, you know, as these images came out of Nashville, that there was a lot of hand wringing on the internet. There was a lot of, you know, talking about, you know, these variants are going to come back because, you know, people are getting back together. So it is still kind of a weird time. We're still in this like little in between time, I think. You know, it's really interesting that the one thing I noticed is the around this mask wearing, I feel like it's less about the I mean, it's, yes, it's about the person, but sometimes it's less about the specific person. It's more about the very, very particular place that they are, not just the city, not just the area of the city, but uh, up and down Broadway here in Nashville, you don't see hardly anyone wearing a mask, at least not at nighttime after they've had a few drinks. I was just in, in <laughs> Florida and I was actually amazed uh, at just how many people were wearing masks outdoors in Florida, hmm, like in given Florida. the rapid it gets. Yeah. But then you go to, and, and that was in most places, but then I, you go to one particular street in Delray Beach, Atlantic Avenue, where all the restaurants are and shops, and it's dramatically lower. But those same people are probably wearing a mask elsewhere, just not on that street. There's something about individual mm. localized mm. places where people are like, oh, yeah, this is a masking area or a non-masking area for whatever reason. Yeah, definitely. So you said this is the the highest attendance ever? They've ever had, yeah. I think they've been doing it for 37 years, and this is the highest attendance they've ever had. Which yeah. I also think goes to show you that, you know, the upcoming holiday season from the fall through Christmas, I mean, it's just going to be crazy. I think everybody can't wait to get back to some of these celebrations again. Yeah. So that brings us to our next poll. I know we just did one, but I feel like we should definitely <laughs> do this one. Uh, do you think we're opening up too fast? I don't want to color this. <laughs> Straight up question, are we open up too fast? Uh, we'll let a few hundred votes get in and then, uh, well, let's see, Mike, what do you think people will say? I don't want your hmm. opinion, I want your guess. What I think people, people are gonna say, this is a harder one. I feel like only 30% of people are gonna say that yes, we're opening up too fast. Uh, Carly? Yeah, and you can agree would. back with Mike's numbers or come up with a new one, so don't feel like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do think people are going to say no we're not opening too fast although I wonder if part of that's going to be colored by where you are because I know some states are reopening up a lot faster than others yeah so so you're both on the same side of things you said most would say no and I think Mike you said the yes number would be around 30 yeah just throwing so, made up numbers out there I think the thing I've learned from this is there is no need to do a poll ever again I'm just going to ask Mike what he thinks other people would say <laughs> Because Mike seems to get it within some sort of margin of error every single time. So, uh, Mike, you are our, our live <laughs> human poll master at this point. Yeah, so about one in three says we're doing it too fast. Okay, so that's good to see. Uh, delicious Burger, what's going on here? Uh, so this is a McDonald's, actually. So, you know, I think in the first part of the vaccination campaign, we saw, you know, a lot of it driven by the federal government. Whereas now it's getting a lot more localized, which means it's also moving into the bars and restaurants a lot more often. So here in Chicago, we've had vaccination campaigns that happen in the bars, particularly because they want to get younger people vaccinated, and that's where they tend to congregate. Uh, but this was actually a group of 70 McDonald's throughout California that became pop-up vaccination clinics with the California Department of Public Health. And you could go into McDonald's, you could get vaccinated, and then they actually gave you a free burger or fries or whatever you wanted at one of the McDonald's locations. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. but, but to be clear, you're not being vaccinated by McDonald's staff. No, you're not. No. <laughs> it's the healthcare worker. Yeah. A mixed vaccination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> vaccination. Yeah. 
And then we're also seeing, you know, as all of these restaurants reopen again, they have this infrastructure that they put into place over the past year. And so they're trying to figure out what to do with it. So this is Kindred in New York, which has one of those outdoor eating areas that we saw become so popular over the past year. And, you know, now they're, you know, open to full capacity again, but they have this cool outdoor eating space. So they've actually turned it into a remote working area. For $25, you get uh, one little table, you get Wi-Fi, you get coffee all throughout the day, and then you get a place to plug in your laptop. Um, and you can sit there, it's yours for the entire day, you can sit there and work. Um, and then at night, they actually say a lot of the people who are using it as a co-working area stick around for happy hour and invite friends over. So, Do you think these will be in the long run? run? Like all these structures that, that were erected, do, or are they gonna be forced to take into this down at some point? Um, we, we were looking into this, actually. I mean, some cities across the country have said, we're going to allow this to continue into the future because it's been so popular. It makes the city look really attractive. Um, but then there have been some, you know, other businesses that say when the streets are shut down, they're impacted by the less traffic. So I think it's really going to be kind of city to city and town to town. Yeah, I hope they stay. They're cool. Yeah, I think they're so cool, too. And then, I mean, the number of new prototypes and new restaurants that we see, um, you know, being developed that are all drive-through only or all pickup um, and then don't have any dining rooms at all. It's pretty much like one a week at this point, like the number of these trains that are releasing them. And they all kind of look like this. So this is Freddy's um, custard and steak burgers. And so this is their new prototype. There's no dining room at all. There's two drive-through lanes. Um, you know, there's an outdoor seating area here. Um, Jack in the Box just released a really similar concept. They have two drive-through lanes. One is for, you know, a typical drive-through customer. And then the other drive-through lane is for anybody ordering through a third-party delivery service. And, you know, I feel like we get asked constantly, is this going to be the wave of the future? Is, you know, takeout and delivery going to be, you know, as prevalent as it was during COVID? Uh, the infrastructure is definitely going to be there. We're definitely going to have enough, you know, concepts out there to support it. Yeah, think of how many um, QSRs kept the drive-through open, closed down the dining rooms. So many of them still have not opened, reopened the dining rooms. They're like, we don't need to. We're doing mm -hmm. great with just the drive-throughs. This is what our new build's going to be. I will say this image gives me a little bit of that dystopian future vibe where every car is gray. But <laughs> I know the cars make it look very unattractive for some reason. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, you don't want to notice the cars. Yeah, notice that's how, true. How awesome yeah. the Freddies look, which it looks, it looks great. Yeah, the, the concept itself, yeah, looks really nice. And I think the thing about them too is, I mean, they're cheaper build outs and you can put them almost anywhere. So you don't need, you know, a big plot of land, which is really important now when land is at a premium. And then this is another, so PF Chang's, you know, they released their PF Chang's to go concept last year. They keep opening them. I think by the end of 2022, they said that they want to have at least 50 PF Chang's to go locations. And so they only do takeout, delivery, and catering through these locations. There's no dine-in service at all. Is it the full menu or is it a, a modified? I know. I think it's an abbreviated menu. I think it's actually their PF Chang's Bistro menu and then a little bit abbreviated from that. Huh, that's cool. Yeah. And we were seeing locations like this even before COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And then this is Ann Pizza, which Carly and I, when we were going through these before, <laughs> we both said, I mean, they just do a really great job in general. Um, but so uh, getting back to vaccinations again, they're trying to get their team vaccinated. So they've started offering $500 bonuses to any team member who is fully vaccinated. And so they think it's going to cost them at least about $280,000. And then based on what they would like to hire this summer, it could go up to $400,000 that they're spending um, to make sure that their staff is vaccinated. Can you talk about the concept? What is and pizza and how is it? Uh, you know, what oh, yeah. It? So this is, uh, I guess it's kind of between a QSR and fast casual chain, maybe more to that fast casual end of the spectrum. Pizza chain out of Washington, D.C., but now they're all throughout the Northeast there. Um, and they, I guess you would say the pizzas are kind of a take on the Roman style pizza. So they're longer, kind of flat. And the flavors are just really, really creative, really. Like they're constantly coming up with really creative new flavors. And the build outs always look fantastic. Like this is yeah, a black awesome. and white one. Yeah, some of them um, have this like really cool yellow concept. Um, they do just a really good job in general. Yeah. And you can build your own, right? Kind of like blazer. Yeah. 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 Uh, Labor. And then speaking, yeah, speaking of bonuses, so I mean, I think this is probably the thing that we've been asked about the most over the past few weeks, which is just the labor crunch. What does it mean? What does it mean for our business? What are operators out there doing? So we, in the next few slides, we'll just look at what some of the operators out there are doing. And so on the next slide here, I mean, speaking of bonuses, 
Um, oh, actually, we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is one that this is a, um, a just a small local ice cream shop in Park Ridge, Illinois. But they posted this message on their Facebook uh, page the other day. And then that kind of hit the news because everybody was talking about the fact that this ice cream shop can't open because they can't get enough employees. Um, they were looking for a manager at $18 an hour to manage the shop. They couldn't find one. They haven't been able to find one for weeks. Um, and so they've actually been closed for, for a little while now. I don't know. Uh, this was a couple of days ago. They might have found somebody since then, since it hit the news. Yeah, it's sort of amazing. Uh, are we going to see a lot of uh, self-serve ice cream places and whatnot at some point? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> if for frozen yogurt, why wouldn't you do it for, for ice cream in some way? I don't know. I feel like we're, we're inviting uh, a boatload of automation in the future. As, yeah, as we yeah, describe. which we'll talk about in a minute, too. And I think the hard thing for a lot of these operators, too, is, I mean, they're trying to get out of, you know, the debt that they incurred over the past year. And so over the next few months, they're trying to make as much money as possible. So if you have to close, it's, it's really difficult for them. And then, I mean, so I just went to Indiana over the weekend, uh, and the number of signs that I saw on the top side of the road at all of the major chains offering incentives like this, it felt like you would pass one and they would be like, we're offering $15 an hour. And then the, the next one, you know, next door to it would be like, we'll do $16 an hour. And so this is actually a McDonald's out of Altamont, Illinois. And they put this sign up in the window that said, you know, if we hire you and you stay for six months, we'll give you a free iPhone. And we've seen so many offerings like this. I know Applebee's was offering free appetizers. They're trying to hire 10,000 people this summer. Um, and I think they said that um, campaign actually brought in 40,000 applicants. So that really worked for them. Um, there was a, a Tampa location of McDonald's that was giving $50 for anybody that applied. Just if you put in an application, they would give you $50. So I may have mentioned this before. I guess this is just personal anecdote and, and we'd have no hard data on this, but I feel like going into typical Kiyosa or fast food place, I see way more teenagers working mm -hmm. there now than I, than I used to. Yeah, um, agreed. Yeah, which is interesting because on the one hand, they actually add a lot of positive energy, right? You sort of get like that vivaciousness from them. <laughs> on the other hand, they're not entirely sure what they're doing in some cases yet, and you can actually feel that as a customer, but it's a different vibe for sure. Yeah, my parents live in Southwest Michigan, just kind of like a summery resort town. And normally in the summer, you get all these hospitality students from the universities who want to come in and, you know, really kind of learn that, um, you know, summer job. And this year they said it's all like young teenagers, like high school students working at all the resorts and restaurants. And then this is Omni Hotels. This was interesting what they were offering. They actually offered a bunch of incentives. But one of the most interesting was um, they actually set aside hotel rooms for new employees. So if you wanted to move to a location for the summer and work at an Omni hotel, but you were concerned about housing or, you know, because everything is for sale right now and prices are through the roof, you could actually live in an Omni hotel room um, for the summer while you were working there. They said it's the first time that they've ever taken guests out of room inventory and offered them up to employees. Oh, wow. And then they also offered other things too. There was like a $250 signing bonus. There's a $500 retention bonus for anybody in the culinary department. I know they were offering a free set of knives. So just like an incredible amount of incentives to get people to, to work at. I would love to live in an Omni hotel. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, all sweet Omni hotel. That's where Opus I guess for, in for everyone um, watching, if you could jump on a chat, what other interesting incentives or perks have you seen uh, be offered up as you know to address the labor shortage anything you've seen in your area so we saw the iphone we saw the 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 free hotel room or you know live in a hotel type of thing what else have you seen in your areas um let's get that conversation going okay, and i think that there was one that we looked at in new york there was a hotel that was offering one of those mirror um isn't that what you have jack the mirror I love like, that fit, thing. This, the, yeah so they were <laughs> offering it to senior staff to to keep them on board yeah, I stare at mine every day and feel guilty for not using it. <laughs> but I love it. Look, and, and unlike other pieces of gym equipment that you don't use, this actually is also a mirror. So at least I mean, <laughs> so it's useful. I mean, yeah. my exercise bike is a good drag rack in my locker. <laughs> uh, what's going on? And then here? Carly, you were saying this is this is a chain that hasn't had as many issues. Yeah. So um 
executives from this chain, and um, if we can hit the next slide, I think we all know that at Starbucks, we're saying that they really haven't been feeling the effects of the labor shortage like some other operators. And th they do, and they have had even pre-pandemic, some of the best benefits in the industry, one of those being health coverage. Um, in addition, they have PTO, they have retirement plans, they have parental leave. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting that a chain that's already known offering these types of benefits hasn't had as many issues on retaining and hiring new talent. And we've seen a lot of operators kind of matching what Starbucks offers, um, like education programs, I feel like are a popular offering. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some data. And then, yeah, so this comes out of our Pulse report, which um, we released earlier this year, and we continue to release portions of it in that Report Pro, um, our Report Pro database. And so we asked operators, you know, what are you considering implementing in the future as a, you know, staffing initiative? And you can see the top two options here are both bonus-based. So 31% of operators said that they're considering offering performance-based or retention-based bonuses to hourly staff. Then just under that at 28%, um, we're offering signing bonuses to hourly employees. Then just under that, um, you know, above market mandated minimum wages. Um, so these all come from the Pulse report. It's actually, this section is all about the labor shortage and it's all in Report Pro right now. Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting, right? So, the, I mean, the, the rank order of the numbers is, is interesting, but they're not super spread apart, right? It really mm -hmm. just sort of shows that um, a lot of operators are considering a pretty wide range of different things to address this. And, and I guess the, the thing that, you know, you gotta remember early on in the pandemic when no one knew exactly how deadly this thing was. And we don't know it's scary. Like people are very, very scared, right? I think I was scared and probably most people were scared. The fact that people came back to work and work, you know, face to face with customers, whether it's, whether it's at the drive through someplace else, that probably took some real bravery uh, mm -hmm. to do. It's interesting that it's now that we see this shortage when some of those segments actually recovered a little bit faster than others, but we're seeing the tail end of this now. And uh, yeah, it seems like more needs to be done to get people in. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, I mean, this slide is specifically about future initiatives. There are slides in the report that look at what operators have done over the past year as well. Yeah, you know, the flip side of it is um, enhanced UI is expiring and will be fully expired by September uh, across the country. We'll see what the impact is there. I know um, in the polling we've done and the polling of this group as well, the feeling is that that has a, it had a very, very significant contribution to the labor shortage. But uh, we'll see soon enough because some states ended it earlier than others. So we'll see if there's a gap in the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a question for everyone. How long do you think that um, the labor shortage is going to last? So uh, the way we frame this is when will things get back to what was normal, uh, you know, is it gonna, are we gonna back to normal before September, later this year, first couple of quarters of next year, back half of next year, 2023 or later, or will it never go back to normal because the labor market is forever changed and this type of shortage may be a permanent reality for the industry? Uh, this one, I had no, uh, no idea how people would guess. Mm -hmm. This is hard. And it's really hard to forecast too. There's so mm -hmm. many variables going on right now. Uh, it seems like every time we have, uh, you know, an unemployment report, it's surprising. Every time we have a jobless claims report, it's surprising in some way, not just a little surprising, like very surprising in, in, in a lot of cases. But uh, Carly, I'll let you go first. Um, actually, I'll just actually let you offer up your opinion. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like this is not as controversial to state your opinion <laughs> publicly. I think we should ask Mike and just close the poll. And I <laughs> <laughs> no, that's too much. <laughs> I have an observation. You know, I'm wondering, Jack, you mentioned earlier, um, I think that, you know, the holidays this year are probably going to be huge, the winter holidays. And I know that's a big hiring time for temporary and seasonal workers. And I wonder how even a bigger holiday season than perhaps ever before is going to impact that. So I almost want to say between October and December 2021 because of that. But I also don't know if we'll see a drop off then after the holidays. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's, see what, point. let's see what people thought. Uh, no one thinks it's happening soon. Uh, three brave people think it's happening in the next couple of months. Uh, some thought maybe by the end of the year, the vast majority think it's going to be next year or later. And if you look at the numbers, um, what is that? Like basically half think it's going to be the back half of 2022 
or later or never at some point. So uh, it looks like this is something we, you know, if we're all right about this, that we're going to be contending with for quite some time. Think about what the implications are, though, right? If, if restaurants and other places are bringing in staff that don't have as much experience or haven't worked there as long, uh, they probably need products that are a little bit easy to use, especially back of house. So if you're a manufacturer and you make speed scratch products or things that are a little bit easier to use or fully prepared products in some cases, I would imagine there'd be a little bit more demand for some of those types of items as we work through this. Um, that just seems quite logical. Okay. Uh, what's going on with the environment? Mm, yeah, so another tough topic to talk about. And I feel like we talk about this at the beginning of the summer every year, just because that's when we see the wildfires start to hit the West again. I mean, this year, the temperatures that we saw in the Pacific Northwest were crazy. And so um, as part of our work with the Food for Climate League, which is the organization that Eve Thoreau Paul heads up, um, we asked consumers earlier this year, how is climate change impacting them or how have they seen it impacting um, those they know. And so you can see here, I mean, the numbers are actually fairly large. So 46% of consumers say that um, they've been impacted by more extreme temperatures or somebody they know has, and then 40% say the same thing about natural disasters. So it is starting to impact people um, on a more personal basis. Yeah. And I, I would say just, you know, from data central's perspective as a, as a company, you know, we know there's some controversy around uh, the topic and we're certainly not advocating that um, you know, this is exactly what's causing climate change, or this is the, 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 you know, this amount of it is due to, you know, human contribution. We just know that from the research with consumers that we do, that people really care about it now more than ever before. And they're starting to attribute what some of what's happening with climate to the food system. You know, previously is about fossil fuels. You're seeing here in much louder conversations about the link between food and climate. So it's, it's something that just, you know, even if your only goal is to figure out how to address the market, it's something to really, really pay attention to. And like you said, Jack, yeah, it's starting to impact our industry and the foods that people eat so much more. Yep. So this was in uh, the article at the bottom here about companies showcasing wildfire protection products at this winery in California just goes to show what they're dealing with. So this was actually um, kind of like an event that they put on of fire protection strategies and businesses that wineries could come see what was offered out there. Um, and they had things like uh, fire retardant gels that you could put on your house and on your property, uh, fire protection services that were private. So just for your business and businesses around there. Uh, there's one winery that said that they had invested a ton of money in uh, being able to turn their pool into a fire hydrant. So it's actually a pump and hose system that you hooked up to your pool so that you can actually turn it into a fire hydrant and put out fires as you know, they came towards your property. And then the article up top there was from Bloomberg News, which was just an interesting look at what's happening to that industry overall. And part of it is not even just the fires themselves, but it's the smoke and what the smoke does to wineries and, and grapes in general. And, um, it, you know, that affects a larger percent of the California wine industry. There was a, a percentage, I think, in the article, I have it here. So in the American West, since the year 2000, an area larger than the entire state of California has burned. And in wine country alone, over the past six years, there have been 23 major fires totaling 1.5 million acres, which is the equivalent of a piece of land that's 130% the size of Sonoma County. So it really is impacting this industry. The Napa Valley wine industry is a $36 billion industry. Um, and so I, mean, I, I feel like every year we just hear more and more about how it's impacting those businesses. Yeah, there is some debate there too, right? Is it is it uh, strictly drought, or is there uh, sort of a, you know controlled burns that, that could be done to, to help prevent this too? But the bottom line is, it's having something's having an impact, and it's going to be a louder and louder conversation. Uh, what is this over here? And then these, I mean, the temperatures that we saw in the Pacific Northwest a couple of weeks ago were just insane. I think Seattle was getting close to what the highest temperature that Las Vegas has ever recorded was. And so these are just some of a weirdly BuzzFeed did a really good look at some of the images coming out of the Pacific Northwest. And this is one of them. This was a supermarket, um, I think either in Portland or Seattle. Um, and a bunch of supermarkets were doing this, just covering up all the produce in order to keep it fresh. 
Um, apparently, you were just saying like there was all these Isn't images. indoors though? Why do you mm -hmm. have to? I don't understand why you have to cover the produce. I mean, one, I don't think the systems that they have in place in the businesses in Seattle and Portland are set up for 115 degree temperatures. You know, they don't have the ACs that we have or that, you know, somebody in the South has. And then I think they said something like only 40 to 50% of, um, you know, buildings overall have air conditioning um, in the Pacific Northwest. Mm. So. Um, but yeah, I think an ice cream was out of stock, ice was out of stock. I mean, you saw all of those, you know, cold foods um, were definitely out. I still don't understand how delivery companies deliver ice cream, like an ice cream sundae. Yeah. <laughs> like you, you, can, you can order a frozen yogurt for delivery five yeah. miles away in Miami, and I don't understand how that works. <laughs> I just don't get it. So. I feel like you can get yogurt soup by the time it gets. <laughs> yeah, <but>. seriously. <laughs> And then this was, this was an interesting, if you've been to Portland, you know, they have a really strong uh, food cart culture. Yeah. And so if you imagine a food cart, I mean, it's basically just a metal box. And so, I mean, if you have a hundred degree temperatures and you're also cooking in that metal box, you can imagine what the temperatures are like inside that food cart. And so it was really, really tough for a lot of these businesses. I'm not gonna even try to pronounce the name. This is a Nordic food cart um, in a food cart pod in Portland. But they said that they actually drilled holes in the side of their food cart to try to let some of the heat out. They have a 20 year old refrigerator that they were afraid wasn't going to make it. They took anything off the menu that they had to cook. So everything was actually um, just cold weather food that they put on the menu. And even still um, their electricity um, punked out and they actually had to close down. And this is just salads. So we've seen a number of chains. I know we talked about Panera in the past um, doing some climate friendly foods, but adding more climate friendly foods to the menu. So just salad, um, their headquarters is in New York, added this salad to the menu. It's their zero footprint salad. So they actually partnered with the zero footprint organization and 15% of all of the proceeds from this salad actually go to regenerative farming and agriculture. Yeah, so I think you do see it a lot more. Of yeah. this. this can be somewhat yeah. common, right? So you mentioned Panera already has a climate climate friendly mm -hmm. food initiatives. Mm -hmm. Chipotle does as well. Now just salad. I think there's going to be quite a bit more in in the next couple of years. So if you're yeah. thinking about it, just know that you know you won't be alone. And then this, I, I feel like this kind of passed under the radar, but that the European Union actually banned plastic cutlery as of July 3rd. So as of July 3rd of this year, you can no longer include plastic cutlery um, at restaurants. And so this image is just kind of a, a funny image that comes these two artists put together this retrospective as part of this um, art event that was going on in London. And so it's called Spoon Archaeology. It's 1400 pieces of disposable pl flatware that they display. And it's kind of supposed to showcase, you know, plastic cutlery as a thing of the past, as something that we would go to a museum to see. So what's the best replacement, like a, like a wooden thing or? Yeah, I think we're going to see kind of all those same things that we saw with straws. So bamboo based, sugar based, wooden, you know, anything. Are those much more expensive though? I feel like that costs a lot more. Uh, a good percentage of them are. And some of them, I mean, to be honest, don't work quite the same. I, 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 I apologize if anyone's watching this and you're a, a paper straw manufacturer. You may, I knew you were going to say, yeah. Uh, well, I'll leave it at that. Uh, okay. okay. A look at plant-based. Look at plant-based. Um, so uh, if we could go to the next slide, Grubhub just released their state of the plate, which is looking at the top ordered and top growing foods and ordering so far on 2021. So it was from January to June. <clears throat> and the two top growing, excuse me, were um, plant-based sausage wrap and Korean barbecue cauliflower wings. And I thought this was so interesting. You know, um, it's becoming increasingly easier and easier to find plant-based foods on menus. And this is proof that consumers are actually ordering them when they're available. And the other interesting thing I noticed was cauliflower wing. You know, a lot of times we get the question, you know, what's growing in plant-based? What are some plant-based trends? And I always tell people, and you can see this cauliflower wing, it's not what's growing in plant-based, it's what's growing in all food and how can you make it plant-based? And we see with this cauliflower wing, we've seen a lot of, you know, buffalo cauliflower flower wings taking advantage or taking inspiration from like traditional wing flavors. But this is actually a trendy wing sauce, Korean barbecue that's being applied to a cauliflower wing. Yeah, and I, I feel like um, to understand plant-based, all you have to understand is some of the questions we've been asked for a while. You know, our perspective for a long time has been, this has been here to stay. And we used to get asked, hey, is plant-based gonna be here to stay? And now we're being asked, 
what's next in plan phase. It's now sort of a foregone conclusion that this is a thing and you're seeing it bear out in all sorts of data. Mm -hmm. And um, in the state of the plate, they also looked at the top cities for vegan ordering. Um, and so I, we have them here and this is looking at the metro areas, so it's Los Angeles, New York, Portland, Oregon, uh, Miami and Philadelphia. And I went to our local database takes a look at the top indexing foods on menus in specific metros. And I pulled out some in each of these metros that are vegan or like uh, vegetarian and plant-based. And you can really see that plant-based diets have kind of a local flavor, just taking a look at these different metros. If you take a look at Los Angeles, you know, you've got like, um, you know, very healthy, very clean foods that are often in smoothies and bowls versus Miami, where plant-based has a distinctly Caribbean flavor. That's really interesting. Yeah. Ooh, this looks good. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold, hold on to that thought. Yes. Uh -oh. Uh -oh, Do you no. know what this is? Did you read about this? No. This is a bread. That looks stick. good to me. <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's just. Yeah, you know. it, it does look good. But now that it's a bread steak, does that change your opinion at all? It's bread steak? Bread steak. That sounds fun to me. Is, is it a bread made of steak or is it a steak made of bread? Is the it's question. steak made of bread. So instead of a cauliflower steak, it's actually a steak made of bread. And um, this is a recipe from basically that came from David Tamarkin, who was uh, the former digital director of Epicurious, which you may remember recently announced that they decided to um, stop publishing beef recipes. Um, and he was a big driving force behind that. So he was talking about how he missed steaks. And you'll hear that a lot when talking about plant-based, you know, it's part of recapturing the and the mouthfeel and the fattiness of the meat. And he was looking for a kind of center of plate option and cauliflower steak doesn't cut it. So he came up with this, it's bread steak. Um, it's basically savory French toast. And uh, well, the internet had some thoughts if we <laughs> the next page. Um, and so uh, it was referred to as uh, dividing the internet. And I pulled a couple reactions here. Uh, someone posted a picture of Texas toast and said, hey, you know what, this breadsteak already exists. And um, my favorite one from Instagram was, this is not a steak, it's a mistake. Look, I saw it, I thought it was some twist on avocado toast or, <laughs> or something, which yeah. makes sense. Probably not a steak. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's there's an important lesson here too is you know he kind of got it right in trying to recapture a lot of that texture and mouthfeel and like the things that meat brings to the plate. But at some point, you know, consumers aren't going to accept recanting things that are clearly not a steak. We know bread is a mistake. So maybe just think about how you're messaging these replacements. Um, this is the Raging Pig Company. They're based in Sweden. Um, they're going to next year. This is their vegan bacon seasoning. And they actually um, started with a Kickstarter. Um, but they just released something. And you can actually um, look on Spotify or Apple if we go to the next slide. Um, maybe you want to eat more plant-based. Maybe bread steak does not sound appealing to you. Um, <laughs> they think they can hypnotize people into eating plant-based. So they've got, um, I believe it's a three-part series up on Spotify. And we got a picture of it ne uh, next if you want to see. I, I got to be honest. The branding <laughs> of this thing actually makes me want to eat meat. <laughs> it has right it's not like a cute picture of a little pig that you don't want to harm it's like this pig wants to kill me so i want to eat some bacon now so uh, i don't know <laughs> wait until you see the picture of um their hypnotist uh <laughs> stuff of nightmares so what, um, this is a yep, podcast or something or yeah, it's, it's a podcast and you've got this like pig man hypnotizing you not to eat meat anymore. Um, so it's a three part series. Uh, so it's on Spotify. Um, it's on Apple. So if anyone wants to try it and let us know if it works, uh, let us know. <laughs> but you can find that. So, you know, here's I have my doubts about these things. Okay. <laughs> Um, and finally, we've seen some interesting chain introductions too that I want to talk about. So this is, um, everyone should be familiar with Taco Bell's naked chicken. The shell here is actually plant-based chicken. It's made from pea protein and they're currently testing it in their Irvine, California location. From the opposite end of the spectrum, and remember with bread steak, we were talking about how, you know, capturing the texture, the mouthfeel, the fattiness of meat. Um, Wendy's went the other way, and they're, um, I believe, re-releasing their black bean burger. And they, when they did um, a lot of, you know, talking about it and made some interesting points about how they really wanted to focus on that flavor and craveability and the textural contact, contrast and the crunch and the spiciness to create something that could stand up against meat or even a plant-based replacer. Yeah, there's the Wendy's one. Uh, how about retail? 
Yeah, so, you know, since we last did one of these webinars that just looked at trending products, there have been a ton of new retail products. And, you know, the next couple are just some interesting things that have come out in the past few weeks. This is one people might have seen because it hit the news and everybody started talking about it. But this is Ristelli's, which is a brand that came up with these flat hot dogs. So the, actually the concept came from the fact that everybody was splitting the hot dogs down the middle so that it had more surface area so they could caramelize it on the grill. And so they were, consumers were asking for pre-split hot dogs. So instead they said, why don't we just go whole hog, so to speak, and actually give them as much surface area as possible. And so they came up with this concept, which is the flat Can hot I just dog. get a vote on this? Can you in chat <laughs> type, on the, type love it or hate it, depending on how you feel on <laughs> Mike, Carly? <laughs> What are your feelings toward this? Well, I mean, the commenters hate it. I mean, I, I, there's maybe one person that likes it. I don't know. I don't feel like this is that bad of an idea. I feel like if you left a, a hot dog in the driveway <laughs> and you ran over it by mistake. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, I have another question, which we were actually debating internally here at Data Central. It's if not baloney. It's a round hot dog. <laughs> does this now make a hot dog a sandwich? So yeah. people have thoughts um, on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I feel like the, the essence of the hot dog is lost. Is, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and then the Sweets and Snacks Expo, there's always some new interesting stuff that comes out of that show. And Jelly Belly did a really good job this year. So on the upper left-hand corner, these are some of their newest bean boozled flavors. So those are those Jelly Belly flavors that are really out there and um, dare you say disgusting. So the two newest bean boozled flavors are liver and onions which in our flavor database is always one of the things that scores the lowest with consumers. And then the other flavor that they came up with is old Band-Aid. So you can taste what an old Band-Aid jelly belly tastes like. And then the other one here is, I just thought it's interesting how far cocktail culture has come. I mean, now that we see, you know, jelly bellies coming up with cocktail flavored jelly beans. Um, and so it's flavors like mimosa and gin and tonic, just some really premium flavors here. That sounds awesome. It looks yeah, like it's more expensive delicious. than a typical jelly belly. I bet it is, definitely. And then this, I feel like we haven't done our job if at the end of one of these webinars you don't learn about some new ingredient or flavor. So Noma, the you know Michelin-starred restaurant out of Copenhagen, over the course of the pandemic, they started these Noma projects. So it allowed them to come up with new retail products or just initiatives in general. And their very first product is Garum. And I learned about it when I learned about, you know, this product alone. So garum is basically a thousand year old Roman recipe for a fish sauce. So it's a Roman fish sauce. So they're doing a garum, but it's actually vegan in this case. So they do two flavors. There's a smoked mushroom garum and a sweet rice and egg garum. They're fermenting right now. They're going to start shipping at the end of the year. Um, and they're just packed with umami. So it's two. Well, the other sweeter. one is, is not vegan if it has egg, right? I think it's a vegan egg, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the coolest if stuff I'm always come out of Denmark? <laughs> <laughs> it really does. Uh, and technology. And then, yeah, I mean, like, as you were saying, Jack, you know, with the labor crunch, everybody's kind of turning to technology again. So Miso Robots, you probably know them from their Flippy Robot that flips hamburgers. But now they're moving in a new direction with a new robot option, which um, this is a beverage station. So it actually um, it integrates with your POS system. It um, fills the cup. It actually puts the cup down. It fills the cup with both the ice and the be beverage. And then it seals it. And then it uses an LED light to show you which beverages are part of which order. Um, and they said part of it is not just the fact that there's a labor crunch, but that with everybody moving to delivery and curbside pickup um, and drive through options, uh, consumers do not like to wait. And so this actually allows you to be a lot faster. So, and this is cold beverage only, or do we know if they do hot um, I believe this one is cold beverage only. I feel like there's not enough space for my 44 ounce cup in this thing. <laughs> it does look small, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of more of a fun marketing initiative, but this is Heineken's beer outdoor transporter. And so they came up with a new shape for their can, and so they wanted to market it. So they're doing a lottery system for this beer robot that follows you around your yard, and you can get a beer um, on ice. At oh, so, so this is not a, a delivery application. This is just for your house? Yeah, just for you. It's a personal robot, yeah. Wow. And then Domino's, you know, all of this technology has driven so much third party ordering and takeout. And so they have a two minute guarantee from when you get to Domino's and you say, I'm here to when they um, say that they'll bring your pizza out. So they actually um, partnered with DraftKings, which is that sports betting platform. 
and you can bet on whether they will meet this two minute guarantee over or under 80% of the time. And then um, if you take that bet, you have a possibility of winning $200,000. That is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> great marketing. And pets, furry friends. <laughs> Um, we wanted to talk about pet food because, um, you know, pandemics, you know, the pandemic puppy, um, lots of people have been adopting during the pandemic. And the American Pet Products Association actually said that 11.38 million households have adopted a pet during the pandemic. Um, and I think, too, you know, um, if we go to the next slide, um, COVID has made us more connected to our pets than ever before. Um, we may have even identified with them. You know, we were stuck inside all day. The high point of our day was box and treats. And increasingly, we may also want them to eat like us. And a variety of pet companies are out there actually appealing to that need. <laughs> I think Jack is <laughs> a pet star. <laughs> Did you identify with your dogs more, Jack, now that you've been inside, stuck at home? I love my cats, but I really love my dogs more. I know it's not <laughs> Whoa, it's wow. Weird. <laughs> um, so we have a couple, um, you know, new pet food companies kind of appealing to that need. Um, and so we have dog and cat examples, one of which is the farmer's dog. Yep, I just saw someone in the chat say that their dog is addicted to it. <laughs> so this is really cool. It's a subscription based company. And you'll see that the um, food actually comes. It's raw human grade food. And um, they actually have the dog's name on it. So it feels really personal, personalized. And you'll say they have the feeding instructions. So it's not just feed one pack a day, you're feeding any one pack a day here. Um, and it's uh, fresh made, it's human grade food. And they say they're one of the first kitchen. So really this is food that if you were hungry, you could open the pack and eat yourself. <laughs> um, similarly, there's another um, cat food company, and there are a couple of these, but these are just two that we've chosen to highlight. This is Smalls, and you can actually take um, a customized quiz to determine what kind of nutrition your cat should be on. Um, these are their treats. You can see that the, branded, the branding is really unique and you know, colorful and trendy, not like a lot of pet food on the market currently. Um, I couldn't find a good picture of their wet food. Um, I'm a cat person, and it cracked me up because the cat's wet food actually says fresh kill on it. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> I think that's a pretty good way to appeal to the owners. And then actually um, in the works, uh, we have put cat food on the Mac. Um, here is our cat food Mac. So we can see in Ubiquity some familiar flavors and formats like tuna, chicken, salmon. Um, and in proliferation, we've got our food toppers, human food inspired, wet treats and organic. And then in adoption, we're seeing some of that trendier stuff. So you, we can see the custom diets like we just saw, freeze dried meat treats. We're even seeing some cocktail inspired treats. Uh, pumpkin, human grade food, and yeah, cat wine. Uh, cat wine. It's like a catnip inspired <laughs> thing, <from> little bottles. <laughs> so I feel like you can put almost anything in life on the menu adoption cycle. Uh, <laughs> a nice job of cat food here. So, <laughs> for the early stage stuff, so these are real. Like, you, there are actually mm -hmm. are cat cocktails and cat wine and kelp free cats. These are real things. These are all real things, yes. Uh, so, where would you put, uh, you know, whatever is cheapest? I'm assuming that's the ubiquity. Uh, yeah, a lot of people just buy that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, this was um, born out of a personal journey. I used to, you know, uh, feed my cat whatever was cheapest, but lately, you know, she's been having some health issues. So now we're on um, food with like carrots and cranberries and like chicken and white <laughs> fish. I think someday she even eats better than I. You know, we've done some preliminary <laughs> research, and I think a lot of people buy uh, food for their pets that uh, is appealing to them. Right, you're sort of appealing to the owner, like, oh, I want Chipotle flavored this. I think that may not care very much, or maybe not even like it, but you're appealing to the person. Which I aren't there like some chefs that are doing some pet food brands now? Yeah, actually, um, Jack Bobby Flay's cat Nacho just came out with his own line of treats. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and are these and things we're seeing for pet food now. Mm -hmm. um, these are actually human food trends that um, are in some pet foods. So things like gluten-free, sweet potato, prime rib, wild rice, probiotic. And these are still like pretty trendy for pets. Um, and if we take a look at where they are in the human menu adoption cycle, if we click, one thing that was interesting to me was that they're all in proliferation. So they're in proliferation for humans. You know, um, they're a little trend forward, but, you know, they're mostly expected. 
And I was thinking, okay, well, what if we take a look at some of the earlier human foods, like an adoption and inception, could we kind of see what's trending in pet food? And it does line up. So um, the first one is turmeric. It's grown on menus by 191% over the past four years and it's in adoption. And I pulled um, some dog foods here and um, the this and uh, the cat foods that we're gonna look at next, like really like humans could eat these, it's fascinating. Um, so we've got um, cookie pals on the next page, which have turmeric and ginger, they're dog treats. And then this one, this you could put on a human menu, you could walk into a health food store and someone would pay $12 for this. It's beef bone broth and it also has turmeric in it. So um, again, you know, we want our pets to eat what we're eating. Is there anything in this stuff that makes it not for humans? Or if I like turmeric and ginger, I should just go for this. I think you could just go for this. You know, that might be a hack instead of um, paying for bone broth at a human store, you know, more cost effective. And you can see I'm on the- I'm going to you if I get sick, but thank you. <laughs> okay, um, and coconut oil too is another one that's an adoption. It's been growing on menus um, by 138% over the past four years. And if we take a look at some cat foods, um, we can see we've got this salad gold with chicken and coconut oil. And I want to read you the description for this wild caught salmon blend cat food because Mike and I were cracking up because <laughs> you could put this on a menu if you did not know this was cat food. It's a sustainably sourced salmon, nutrient rich veggies, and superfoods like coconut oil, turmeric, and dandelion greens. Yeah, that sounds amazing and expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, we have just a couple minutes to go over some TikTok stuff. Give them the TikTok. Oh, yeah. report. Mike, you're going to do this in quick order as well. We'll be really, really fast. So this is one that you might have seen out there, which is watermelon with mustard on it. So there was a TikToker out there that tried this, and then Lizzo tried it, and it blew up. And so actually, Carly and I have prepared some watermelon with mustard <laughs> that we can munch on while we do this next section. Um, um, the mm. idea is, actually, it's not that bad. That's good. It sounds weird, but mm -hmm. it's kind of delicious. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it has that, like, salty, like, mm -hmm. like sweet flavor. I mean, if you think of, like, feta, arugula, and... Mm -hmm. um, well, if you do a charcuterie really plate with mustard, there'll be fruit on there, too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you yeah. do and melon, right? It's okay. This is good. This is good. You got like the kind of um really tangy like with chili lime juice and sour cream. <laughs> yeah. So that has five million views on TikTok. The pasta chips, so air fried pasta chips have three hundred million views for the pasta chips hashtag. It's basically making pasta, putting it in your air fryer, and then turning them into chips. I feel like it's only a matter of time till we see a big Italian chain offer these as an appetizer. The next one, we won't actually watch the video since we don't have time. But if you've heard of Snickles, so these have actually been around for a while. It's a pickle stuffed or, or a Snicker bar stuffed into a pickle. Um, but I feel like with TikTok, there's such a need for this wacky out there content for people to react to that it becomes popular again. So over the um, past couple of weeks, we've seen Snickles start to trend on TikTok again. And then the next one here is Oreo sushi. So it's um, two ingredients, Oreos and milk, and you basically deconstruct it and then reconstruct it into this sushi concept. I think the lesson here is really just, you know, if you're a brand, making sure that you're paying attention to how um, consumers on social media are interacting with your brand. Um, and a good example of a brand that actually um, paid attention to that is Starbucks. They found that all of these um, consumers were coming in and ordering drinks that people had developed on social media and they had never heard of. So the drink on the right there, people on TikTok call it the moon drink. Um, and so, you know, consumers would come in and be like, can I have the moon drink? And their baristas had no idea what they were talking about. So they've developed this social sips platform on their app that you can actually order some of these social media beverages awesome. and the baristas know what it is. Yeah, it's really smart. Yeah. And then this very last one, I have to give credit to Jacqueline on our team who is not in right now, but she loves Disney. And so this is the new PIM test kitchen at Disneyland in California, which is based on the Ant-Man uh, movie. And so everything here is basically giant or shrunk down. And then you can see at the top there, they have the pretzels that go into um, the machine there and they actually blow up the pretzels. And then on the next um, slide here, you can see some of the offerings on the menu. 
And um, these have all been super popular on social media because they're so Instagrammable. You can see there's a giant candy bar there. There's that giant chicken sandwich, which kind of looks like those Midwestern tenderloins. You see the oh, wow. giant um, pretzel in the background. They do a wedge salad that has a giant crouton. Um, you could just see, I mean, really, really kind of fun, creative stuff that they're doing. What is that thing at the bottom, that chocolate thing? The, that's the giant candy bar. So it's oh, a big, shareable okay. candy bar, yeah. All right. Well, with that, oh my God, we actually made it with a minute to go. Uh, I was worried we were going to go 10 minutes over. We made it just in time. Everyone, thank you so much for sticking with us. We'll be back in two weeks going over some more heavy data on where we are with the reopening and beyond. And uh, we'd remind you, if you haven't had a chance yet, jump into Report Pro or come ask us what you can do to get access and literally get everything that Data Central has to offer. It's ready to use. It's presentation ready. It's fantastic, and there's just a ton of material there for you. Um, and with that, uh, thank you all. If I could ask Carly uh, and Mike, if you can all stick on for a couple of minutes while we close this thing out. But thanks, everybody. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone.